Well, hi, good morning, and welcome to my shop and for another day. Yeah, what with this radio? Yes, I finished this radio yesterday, but I'm going to spend today doing some experiments with it. This is a fairly simple radio, and it exhibited a symptom, I'll call it, of something that I want to explore a little bit further in the radio. But first, it's cleaning up my shop here a little bit, picking up some cords off the floor. I picked up this cord. This is just, you know, you probably have some spare cords like this. Standard cord just laying on the floor. Nothing old about it. But something funny has happened to it right up in here. So we're going to take a close look at this because at a glance, it's pretty weird. Let's do that right away. So uh, it's just been sitting on my shop floor. Nothing too special going on in here. In fact, everything that's going on in here, if you're a regular watcher, you know it. <laughs> you know it all already. Let's see what we can see here with this. I'm just going to fix the uh, focus here so we can get a little, little closer to it. Or can I? Yeah, hold, hold on the fork here just for a moment. I just have to, as I seem to forget to do this all the time, call up the uh, dialog box for that camera so I can uh, alter the focus on it, you know, make it much, much closer. Okay. What happened to this? Look at that crack. Sure looks like it caught fire. So this is just laying on the floor probably for the last six months. It could have been much longer. It was kind of out of sight. Um, this is really, really odd. So now, <laughs> funny thing, I looked at a lot of blown power cables in my day, about a thousand blown power cables, examining them to try to determine the cause. Uh, they look a lot like this, uh, only the cable is not the size of this little wire, it's the size of my arm. But they had a look something like this, different materials though. So it occurred right in the bend. This, this this wire was bent like this. I was pushed up against something. Well, there's nothing under there. There's nothing... Ooh, maybe there is something <laughs> under there. Just on the floor under my bed. It really looks like a chemical attack of some sort. And the... Uh, well, I like to poke at it here. I mean, I, I'm not about to lose anything. This is totally shot. Let's see if this is gooey or is it hard. Well, it's, it's hard. Not gooey. One wire looks perfectly fine. Well, looks looks really good. The other wire, terribly messed up. What happened to this one wire? This is a lot more interesting than I, I expected. So it's 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 acting like it's like it. Uh, you know, there's only a couple of strands in there. As far as I know, I haven't used this wire for uh, well for. I don't know how long. I mean, I got a number of these laying around. I don't keep track of them or anything. Okay, now I kind of wrecked it up here, but let's take a look at the conductors themselves. Well, they're broken. Huh. I wonder if there's broken strands in the other wire. 
right in the bend where I guess if you bend it enough, you might you might break wires. I think it take an awful lot of bending back and forth to, to break them. They're definitely broken though. This is a case of uh, only a few strands carrying power and the wire getting hot, but not hot enough to damage the other wire, but hot enough to ruin the plastic cover, which is probably a different kind of plastic on the cover. We we got to open up this other wire. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to cut this right through here. The rest of the wire looks fine. I don't see anything. It's very much. This is I've never ever seen something uh, like this. Never had a, 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 a like a power wire fail like this. You see the color of the copper. If it's hot, it can change color. I don't see any color change in it. So this probably got, you know, warm enough to do all this, but not so hot. This would burn your house down. Why didn't the other wire get uh, damaged? Amazing. Okay, so I've, I've cut it already, so I'm going to pull the sleeve off here. The, the, uh, so the, the damage does not extend up the wires. So it's not like there was a short circuit and the entire wire was overheating, which can happen. You know what? In a power cable system, you can have, say, a kilometer of cable. That cable costs $200 a meter to install. You can have kilometers of it. And if you make the wrong move, the whole thing can look like this. You'd have to make a, a really embarrassing wrong move, but that's what's at stake on power systems. So I'm going to strip the good wire. We'll see what's under it. Um, so I wanna, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut this. I'm going to knock the camera over. I'm going to cut it up here too. So cut out the fault. This is this is this is bizarre. This is what I did. I did this for six years for uh, Toronto Hydro. They would uh, have a cable failure. I'd run out in the field to where the cable had failed, wait for the crews to pull out the defective cable, then they'd cut out a meter, just like I've done here, only this isn't a meter, this is like a couple inches. And they'd give it to me, I'd throw it in my truck, I'd take it back down to the head office of Toronto Hydro, into my little laboratory, which was actually a closet. Okay, now there's three here to look at. And I'd do just what I'm doing here. I'd cut it up and look at it and scratch my head. And what happened here? So, now, one of these is going to be a neutral. I, I, I'm guessing the green one is the uh, is the neutral. So it looks like it was shorting against the neutral. Maybe there was a bang, a bang with this thing too. Two two wires in, in and the one in the middle is just fine. Oh, is it just fine? This must have produced a fair bit of smoke. I haven't been able to smell this. So, of course, the plastic has lost its its flexibility. So, you over overheat the wire a bit, and then the next time you uh, you bend it, and then this is what's happening inside under that cover. So, I don't think there's broken strands here. Let me see if I can just chip off some of this. We'll see. It's the other wire I'm really interested in. I don't want to cut any strands here. Just nip it. Oh, there, there, there is one strand hanging out there. So always one of the possibilities is a manufacturing defect. When they're making cables, you know, they're they're making the strands you see. They're bundling the strands into a cable, cabling them. When, you know, look at now you can really see the broken ones. But you know, they can't make as uh, uh, they can't make a length of copper that's infinite. So at some point, even inside cables, there are splices made right from the manufacturer. I don't see any evidence of that here whatsoever. Whether that would happen in this kind of wire, I, I doubt it. 
green. A lot of green, green in there. Green right in amongst the uh, turns. Okay, now I started to wonder how many other wires of my house are like this. So now this guy sat here with the other two wires doing their thing and he got a little bit damaged there. I used to take photographs of all the uh, cable failures and unfortunately I, I didn't bring any of that when I finished working at that company I didn't bring any of it with me I left it all behind so up here the wire is flexible but here it's not because the insulation has been cooked all through here it's not it's not what it was so it, it's ready look at that look at that beautiful thumbnail there it's ready to oh it's pretty tough holy smokes this is this is really really hard Really hard. Let me put a tool on it. Well, I can't imagine there's any broken strands in here. I mean, but 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 we should look. What I imagine. Okay, I'm gonna break them if I if I do too much of this. Oh, it's really really solid. You know, like up here, you know, you know, just bend it around all I like. But this is this is gone really solid. So if you force a bend into the cable right here, it's gonna crack for sure. Let's get the cover off of this. So I used to keep records on all the cable failures, uh, a one pager, a little report I made up, photographs, diagrams, uh, any information I picked up about it that was any significance. So you can think of these cables as being a kilometer or two long, and when they fail, it's a, look, at, look at how, uh, how there's corrosion in this. Now, why? Why would there be corrosion inside this cable? Uh, when you burn some of these plastics, they produce uh, smoke which is chemically active and can corrode things. That's one possibility. Another possibility is water got in, but you know, it's sitting on the floor in my shop. I don't think it's been anywhere else. There's no broken strands in here. No real signs of overheating from the conductors themselves. Don't pull it right off. So any heat effect Pull the other one. Pull the other one off here. Any heat effect has come from the outside. Ooh, gee. Oh, gee. A little hard to pull off, but oh, I got some of it out. Not all of it. So it's it's probably kind of fused into the plastic. There we go. Oh, not all of it. Well, I don't know what we're going to figure out now. Yeah. So some of those strands just do not want to come out. And they're probably kind of corroded into the inside of the plastic. The rest of them now look just like so much uh, fine hair from the top of my head. Okay, so what do we deduce from all this? Uh, number one, maybe. The way I hang my cords may not be a good idea. <laughs> Let me change cameras here. So, like anybody, I, I hang them like that. I, you know, when they develop a, a bend. This thing appears to have faulted right here. Why? It, you know, I just can't imagine. I can't imagine that this is going to damage this wire doing this. I can't imagine. You'd have to do this a thousand times. Like, bending and breaking copper is very, very difficult. No evidence of water. Moisture. Was it mechanically damaged? Did I cut it? Why did I cut through it? I cut through it without knowing it. And then that set up some kind of low level leakage path. It's, it's all hard to believe. But we saw it. There it is. So, what do I do in my old job? So, I write a little report on this cable failure, stick it in a file. Six months later, there'll be another cable failure on the same uh, circuit, on the same electrical run, maybe even the same section of cable, might be a kilometer long section, broken into 50 and 100 meter pieces. One of them blew a year ago. Next one blows. I get out my old file from the last one. I look at the pictures, I look at the stuff. Hey, 
it's the same thing again, whatever the thing is. And that's how I taught myself how to analyze cable failures. It's such a shame I don't do it anymore because I got pretty good at it actually. <laughs> I got really good at it. Yes, I got lots of stories. Well, let's get on the radio here. I got some crazy stories from my day at the power company. Uh, I'm, I'm so far into talking about blowing cables and I started entertaining myself here off camera looking at these images. I thought, you know what, why don't we just carry on with this whole theme of a blown piece of cable. Yeah, wire in my house, but power cable in big cities. So you're looking at some images here. You can see what I searched on. Paper insulated lead covered cable failure. And these are some of the pictures that came up. Let me just show you some of the interesting things that are in here. Let's start with this one right here. I'll just click on it. So what's going on here is this is a cable there's the conductor, conductor of another cable. This is paper insulation. Can you see the lap marks where it's been lapped on? And over here is some shielding. And this is a lead. This is a lead, you can think of it like a lead pipe, although it's called a lead sheath. That uh, makes the cable perfectly watertight like any pipe would. What he's doing here is he's got a ladle full of very hot molten solder, very, very hot. If he's just starting, it's very hot. And he's catching it with this ladle down here. And he's going to switch the ladle positions and pour it again. So fill up in here, he's going to flip it around and pour it down. And what he's doing is he's pouring hot solder on this sleeve. So this is a metal sleeve. Can you see there's a split in it right there? The split sleeve that he's fit on. It looks like a split sleeve to me anyway. He's fit it on and now he's going to pour solder through the split right into the strands of this. It's going to heat this whole thing up to the point where the solder uh, uh, will melt on it, if you like. It's going to heat this whole thing up to solder temperature, I guess is what I want to say. And then as he works away here, the solder temperature drops and drops and drops until it's close to um, sort of a semi-molten state. And then it takes different actions here to finish this off at that point. That's what's going on here. So that, so when I got my little soldering iron out, poking around with little tiny wires, I'm thinking about this. I saw this being done many, many times. Let's go back. A lot of smoke. You don't see it here, but there's a ton of smoke coming up when the fellow's doing this. Here, look at this picture. So here's a three-phase cable. This is exactly what was this is exactly what I was working with. Paper insulation here. See the paper's brown. It's called craft paper. Craft paper is paper that has not been processed all the way. It has not been bleached. It has not been bleached white because nobody cares. But if you bleach this stuff white, you can't get the bleach molecules, whatever that is, out of the paper enough to build a cable. Because you can't have anything conductive in here. This is very, very special paper, which maybe I'll say a little more about in a minute. There you can see the sleeves. There's no split mark. I don't think these are split sleeves. So they push the conductors all the way in until they're butted up against each other right in the middle. So they hope. It takes a lot of planning. These wires can't be moved around. Look, he's shoving, he's hammering wedges in here to space out the conductors. This is exactly how it's been done for like a hundred years on these cables. These cables have been around for just under a hundred years. Paper insulated cable. You can bend these cables because these paper lappings, there's little gaps, little gaps. And as you bend the cable, the gaps will close. As long as you don't bend it too far, the paper won't uh, crash into itself. There's a certain amount of flexibility in this huge cable. The, uh, see the strands are twisted? Well, the whole cable, each individual face, is also twisting down the cable. All this to try to build some kind of uh, flexibility. There you can see the the shield back here, the metal shield on it. Well, I get very excited looking at this stuff. Let's see what else we can find. Maybe we can find some blown, we'll find some blown cables here in a minute. So this is, this is a shot of, uh, it's a bit of a small picture, isn't it? Uh, it's a bit of, it's a shot that this is exactly what I would see going into manholes. Manholes are big concrete boxes full of dirt and disgusting stuff on the floor. They're, they're, they're uh, 
hell holes of what they are, really. They're terrible. So if you look at this cable and this cable, the, these are the splices. See how big they are? This cable is bigger than your arm or about the size of your arm, if you like. This one's wrapped in some kind of black fireproofing material, which I'll explain in a minute. This one's wrapped in a white material. This is almost certainly asbestos cloth. This is literally the worst kind of asbestos you can encounter. And here's another one wrapped with black stuff. This is older. This is newer. Asbestos, as you know, asbestos, not a favored material anymore. So on the system I worked on, thousands of these wraps were removed by crews late at night wearing uh, complete protective gear and all that kind of stuff. And then the cable would be washed down with oil. Oil. So these cables have oil in them, but it's not exactly free oil. There's a little bit of excess oil, but it's not like oil is flowing up and down them. The paper has been impregnated with oil. Impregnated. So what they do is they take, after they make the paper, they take huge reels of it, stick it in a tank. I'll go back. After they put the paper on the cable, they then take the papered insulated copper conductors and stick them in a huge tank, a big reel of this stuff. Uh, stick it in a huge tank. I've seen the tank. Huge tank. Seal the top and then evacuate the tank. So they pull a vacuum in, inside this huge tank with the cable inside. Pulls the air out of the paper fibers. Pulls the air out of the paper fibers, which are like little tubes. Once they get the vacuum where they want it, they then allow oil into the tank thousands of gallons of oil go in and then when they release release pressure the oil will flow into the tubules or into the fibers of the paper impregnating those tubes that's why it's paper that's why it's called uh, paper insulated lead covered they don't actually say the word impregnated but uh, it's impregnated paper now what, what what's this oil so this oil is oil that is leaked out of the cable. It's possible it dripped down from this one. Drip, drip, whoops, drip here. Or it's leaking right out of this cable, right in this area. Oil coming out means water can go in. So if this is a flooded manhole, water is going to go in. And some length of time later, a day, a week, a month, a year, boom, this will blow up. Let's look at one of these after it blows up, because I think there's a picture of it, of one. Well, here's one right here. So this is typical of what I would be dragging back to my little shop to cut apart and see what went wrong. Can you see a little bit of copper right there? So generally, a failure in a splice like this that occurs at one end, not where the actual splice connection is, but just at one end is indicative of water entering the splice. And it soaks this end first, the conductors are closest together right, right down in here. They're splayed apart a little bit, you know, with extra insulating tape and stuff. The cable jointer put in there. Here's another one. This one doesn't look, this does not look like a explosion. This one looks more like an explosion because it's all peeled back. And you see some copper. This looks like, wow, you can see something going on under here. Somebody's taped over this. Who knows why? Well, hard to say. This could be an internal fault in here, or it's a sleeve that split. Because the, these cables are alive, you know? They're operating. They get hot and cold every day. The electric power system cycles temperature-wise up and down every day. Everything in it expands during the day, contracts at night. A lot of it doesn't matter. What, you know, so what if a transformer tank is expanding and contracting a bit? Well, I guess it will wear out the seals in it eventually. And these cables, because they run, like in my case, or where I used to work, be 100 meters to the next manhole, the 100 meters of cable here, and if you change its temperature 40, 50 degrees C, uh, from peak to, to minimum, you get a half inch movement, half inch expansion of the cable into the manhole. Uh, now you're going to learn some real uh, power cable engineering. Um, this is a big problem. So if if this cable is expanding and it's pushing this way, and meanwhile the same thing's happened from the other end, and it's pushing this way, 
it's pushing on this cable splice. Uh, a couple things can happen. The cable will move laterally back and forth every day and that'll scrape it on things and we're talking about one motion a day but we're talking about 20 or 30 years of it. And these are really heavy as you can imagine so a little bit of scraping where they come into the manhole. Is there a quick picture here? Of a manhole duct. What are these birds doing here? No quick picture of a manhole duct. Uh, well, right, yes, there is. Right here. Not quite. So you can imagine this is the same one we were looking at before. Just see, just see, it's going out of a hole in the wall here. And the cable will go back and forth and wear itself out here. The, the problem with all these kinds of failures is they're happening in manholes. People work in those things. So you don't, if you were in this manhole when this cable blew, really good chance you would be maybe killed, certainly injured. And I talked to people who experienced this kind of thing and uh, where I worked, and they refused to ever go in a manhole again. That's how frightened they were. They were sure they were going to be killed. I won't go into the details of that story, but, uh, but uh, yeah, never again. Imagine that, eh? There is an enormous amount of power available at one of these guys. Now, they're conveying a lot of power. Well, a cable like this can power a tall building without too much trouble. But uh, that's not the power I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the fault current capability. If you develop a failure here, the amount of current and power that can flow into this is enormous. Faults on these things last, on my system, five, six, or seven cycles. So a fraction of a second. A fraction of a second and you get a great big boom. Scares the bejesus out of anybody who's near it. Because these happen under the streets, under the roads. And, uh, oh look at this guy. Wow. Okay, so again it's a very small picture. But look at how much of it is blowing out. And there you can see the conductor right there. If the protective uh, system on the power system is slow to act, or if it fails to act, this turns into a conflagration, you know, within another 20 cycles, within a fraction of a second. There's some other kind of weird fault right in here. Area of fault between red and blue phase. Barrier tubes too high up the cores. So this is some kind of construction issue uh, they decided has resulted in this. Uh, really? I would always think it's water. <laughs> water, 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 water everywhere. Now, is there anything else of interest I can show you here? Um, there's just more pictures of, of uh, cable splicing going on. So, um, oh, this is a Y splice. So you can see that. You have one cable here and two over here. This is a very difficult splice to make. You know, I have trouble bending wires into place when I'm working on these radios. Imagine bending this thing into place. Uh, this is a whole day project for a guy, for two guys. There's usually two guys doing this. A jointer and a jointer helper up above the manhole. He's busy cooking up the, uh, the uh, lead that's going to be needed for this. This is his lead splash tray. If while you're working in here, some of the lead should splash onto the floor, it explodes because the floor is wet. This looks like a very clean environment here. But usually in a mantle there's a bit of water on the floor. And if anybody ever says to you, I'm a power cable splicer, ask to look at their wrists. You'll almost certainly find that they have significant burns on the inside of their wrists. Yeah. It's, it's quite a job these pictures here. Well, maybe that's enough. That's enough on this. I'll just pop a few more pictures up here. So this guy's got an old style soldering iron. It's a big hunk of metal here that he's heated up in a torch. And then he's brought it over. It looks like he's got a piece of solder in his hand here. What exactly he's up to, I don't know. This, this is, looks like a training school. You can see the cable's cut. So this is a jointer school, and he's practicing. And maybe they're forcing him to learn with the old tools, or maybe it's still done exactly this way today. Yeah, it looks like we're getting way off topic here. 
to see if we can find another interesting one to talk about. Um, now what this guy's done, he's bent these back so much. What is he doing? See how it's all disrupted here? This is way beyond the... You're not supposed to do this at all. So now it looks like he's got a crimping tool here. He's trying to fit it onto a sleeve. He's going to get this cable, shove it in there. He's bent these out of the way so he can operate, but this is bad. He's damaged this cable. This cable's ruined. It's ruined. That's what I say. <laughs> Man, you made a mess of this job. Again, he's, he's in, a, uh, in an environment here where he's just playing around. Look how he's dressed. Yeah, he's not real. He's probably the sales guy. Here's a good shot. Here's a couple good shots here. This is a good shot of what it looks like in a manhole. That's it. He's got to find a place to make the splice. He, he's got to work around these other cables. Look, all the stuff's hanging over here. And, uh, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough job, I think. Here's another one. These guys getting it ready. See, he's put these plastic covers on here. I think it's just a temporary protection while he's working. I think that's what that is. Maybe not. Who knows? I'm guessing. Again, great big cable. Lead, lead looks, uh, it looks like asbestos wrap again. Lots and lots. So the, these, uh, the voltage on these cables, uh, this looks like a 13,000 volt cable, which means it's uh, 8,000 volts between phases and uh, 13,000 to, to ground. Um, that's kind of the highest distribution voltage you'd find under the streets of a city. You might find some at 28, uh, but not, not this type of cable. 13.8 is the most common distribution voltage, 13.8 kV. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I hope you found this interesting. Uh, I, uh, I did. <laughs> I'm going to have to show my own photographs now. I do have some somewhere. Yeah. Oop, oop. Air. I've been in manholes like this. I mean, this would be close to a power station. And this is, there's the duct bank. And see all the cables coming out and how they're spread out on the walls. And then there's room to make these big splices. Great big lead splices. Here he's working on one down here. See, he's got the lead sleeve. He's smart. He's put the lead sleeve on and slid it up the cable. Later, when he's finishing, he slides the sleeve down and then does what are called lead wipes, which we didn't see anybody working on a lead wipe here, but there's a technique for soldering the sleeve to the cable sheath to make it all waterproof. He's got a material on the outside here. All These are all ready for being soldered up with some kind of a paste that he put on here. Look at all the splices here and here. They come in a manhole like this, the first thing you do is look for oil leaking out of cables. Look for the water line on the wall. Assess how much of this was underwater. Maybe, you know, often these have to be pumped out before people can go in them. Sometimes the water will come right up to the top. Sometimes in the water cycles with rain, it goes up and then it drains out, it goes up and then drains out. Sometimes there's sewage in there. Yeah, sewage. And that's a telephone cable, so we won't talk about that at all. Okay, um, so I was going to work on a radio, but it looks like I'm not. Let's look at a cowboy for a minute. Um, Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's the end of my, my video here. So, hope you got some kind of kick out of that. I kind of got thrown into it because of my little wire thing this morning. Oh, look at these guys. Uh, now, this is an older manhole. You see the uh, roof is beginning to fail right in here. This is a communications splice. They've These are not very watertight. See how it's mounted up high on the wall? It has a little bicycle thing here. You can pressurize these. You might be able to pressurize these. Some of these are run with uh, nitrogen in them. The idea is if you get a hole, the nitrogen comes out, the water does not go in, you see the drop in pressure, you can then go out and measure. Maybe that's what this is. You measure the pressure here and you can deduce where the leak is on these uh, communications cables. These are all power cables down here. 
they're all just kind of thrown in. This, this is not a very good arrangement here, on top of each other. Uh, so one of the things that can happen in a manhole like this is, if you have a cable failure, and the failure is not uh, snuffed out fast enough, you know, in five, six, seven cycles, it will set other things on fire. And I'm not talking about a small amount of heat here. You can make a huge amount of toast in a really quick moment with a fault on one of these cables. So I have seen, yeah, I won't go into the stories of what I've seen right now, but uh, believe me, it's also very explosive. When these things short out, they flash heat the air in here. This becomes a cannon. It blasts the manhole lid off the top and it can blast it up 20, 30 feet in the air. There was a police officer in Buffalo driving down the street, well, this is maybe 1980-something, driving down the street in Buffalo, and a cable failure in a manhole popped the lid into the air high enough that he drove into it, it came through his windshield and killed him. Killed by a flying manhole lid. Can you believe it? Uh, I don't live in a big city anymore, uh, so there really isn't... There's a little bit of underground cable actually here in Aurelia. But uh, it's not like uh, Toronto or whatever. I never stand on manhole lids. I never stand on transformer grates. Never, never, ever stand on a transformer grate. Walk around it. Walk around it. You never know when the equipment's going to explode. And you can go just like a family went in Winnipeg some years ago, standing on the grate. Of a... Isn't that terrible? Yeah, I'm getting into these terrible stories now, so... Anyway, yeah, okay, too much um, memory uh, going on, memory lane here for me. So again, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, I don't know what that guy's doing, uh, splice. Hey, look what he's going to do here. Gonna pull the cable up out of the mantle, make the splice. It's probably a communications cable. I have no idea what he's doing here. But he's working outside the mantle. When he's all done, he'll shove this all back down to the mantle. This looks like a communications manhole lid like a telephone company manhole lid. This looks like a splice case laying here. He's going to put on top of there when he's done. I can't stop myself. I just can't stop myself. Yeah, there's all the bits and pieces you can buy. Buy a special hammer. There, buy a special hammer. That's just showing a three conductor cable sliced right through. So you can see the three conductors. You can see the copper shield. This was an invention. Th this, this shield I'm, I'm outlining was an idea somebody got named Hochstetter. And so he invented the Type H cable. Before that, there was no shield here. So the electric lines of force pressured the paper all the way from the conductor edge all the way to out here, the, un underneath the lead sheath. You can really see now there's a lead pipe here, right? The result of that is lateral voltage gradients over surfaces of paper. You really want the electric stress to go straight through the paper, like, like from here to here. Straight through the sheets of paper. Many, many, many sheets of paper lapped in here. But if somehow you get the electric stress traveling this way, over the surface of the paper, the paper acts very differently and you can get problems. Plus, right in the center of the cable, it's a construction nightmare, if you like. It, it, it's not uniform in here. Now, they jam lots of little fillers. There's some filler stuff in here, filler stuff in here, but before Mr. Hochstetter came along in about 1927, maybe, all, the, all these types of cables went in without this shield. And uh, when I was working at uh, Toronto Hydro, we were pulling out cables that had blown that were that vintage from the 20s, from the 1920s, been operating for, at that time, 60 years. And they always failed right in the middle here. With a, a huge explosion. It just blows the cable to pieces. Pow! As opposed to a short here. You know, a short here, you get a burn mark like this. You get a hole like this. But a short in through here, kapowie. Big boomer. And the oil they put in these, yeah, I can talk all day on this. The oil they put in these in the early days was, I don't know if it was vegetable oil, but it wasn't stable. And the oil would slowly turn into wax. It would like hydrogenate inside the cable. The problem with that is wax doesn't flow. The oil 
can move around a little bit. Even though there really isn't a lot of excess oil in these things, there is a bit. And it'll flow into gaps, holes. Again, maybe in this area where construction is difficult, it, the oil will fill up any gaps that are in here. But if the oil turns to wax, eventually you've got air in the cable. Air or other gases in the cable. And uh, you're going to have a breakdown surface. And then you're going to have a full breakdown. Kapawi. There's a whole history to these cables. How, how, you know, how do they end up making cables this way? With a lead, a lead sleeve and lead, a lead, uh, in a lead pipe. How did they ever come up with all this? Well, there's a long history to how it got to this point. Was a, was it Pirelli? Pirelli is, uh, Italy was ahead in all this kind of stuff back then. I Italy was a, a technological monster at that time. Um, and I think they're the ones that, that came up. Some some Italian came up with this technique, I think. The art of cable splicing. It is an art. Okay, I gotta stop because uh, if I keep going here, yeah, because I'm not gonna stop. <laughs> I'll be here till noon talking away about this stuff. So okay, so a little bit of a change of pace from what I planned to do. Well, that's okay. That's okay. I can I can explain it to my boss. It's no problem. So thanks for watching this uh, uh, kind of odd video of mine. And uh, tomorrow we'll do something with this radio. Yeah, that'll be good.